There's no such thing as a good or bad memory. There is no such thing as a good or bad memory. There's just a trained memory and an untrained memory. Does that make sense? Now, here's the thing. I grew up with these learning challenges. I had all these difficulties all through school, all through elementary, middle school, junior high, high school. I had all of these challenges. At the age of nine, I remember a teacher looking at me thinking I wasn't either smart enough to, to understand what she was saying or wasn't paying attention. She was talking to another adult and she said, that's the boy with the broken brain. And I was like, at nine years old, right? And so those kind of identity issues, those beliefs, does that make a difference? Yes, right? And a lot of people believe that they can't do certain things. They can just never remember names. So I could teach them a strategy, but if the belief is, that does not change, what happens? It's not because it becomes self-fulfilling. I remember running a marathon and I, preparing for it, I read a chapter of one of the books and it was on the psychology of running a marathon, right? The mental part. And it said this verbatim, word for word. So I'm never It said, your brain is like a supercomputer and your self-talk a program that will run. So if you tell yourself you're not good at remembering names, you will not remember the name of the next person you meet because you program your supercomputer not to. A lot of people say, oh, I have a bad memory, right? And they always think, I have memory, or I have focus, or I don't have focus, or I have creativity, I don't have creativity. I want you to scrap that. Creativity is not something you have, it's something you do. Focus is not something you have, focus is something you do. Energy is not something you have or don't have, it's something you do. Memory is not something you have, it's something you do. And what's the benefit of turning it into a do as opposed to something you have? What's the benefit? You have control over it because you can put it into a process. It becomes a strategy because there's a strategy for reading faster. There's a strategy for remembering names. There's a strategy for having focus. And it's a verb, not a noun. I'm the why guy. I don't know why you do what you do. What is your motive for action? What is it that drives you in your life today, not 10 years ago, or are you running the same path? Because I believe that the invisible force of internal drive activated is the most important thing in the world. I'm here because I believe emotion is the force of life. All of us here have great minds. You know, most of us here have great minds. But we all know how to think. With our minds, we can rationalize anything. We can make anything happen. I am one decision away from a totally different marriage, a totally different life, a totally different job, a totally different income, a totally different uh, relationship with my kids. Not like one decision of divorcing you in, in the marriage example, but one decision on... You know, you could be having a conversation with your spouse and you feel your emotions rise up and within a tiny window, those emotions can take over and can impact how your marriage goes. Or you can learn how to take control of that micro moment and make a decision to act in a way that actually shifts your marriage. Your life comes down to your decisions. And if you change your decisions, you will change everything. The mind has the tactical advantage over you at all times. At all times of your life, the mind has a tactical advantage over you. Why is that? It knows what you're afraid of. It knows your insecurities. It knows your deep, dark lies. And it starts to push you away from that shit. It pushes you in a direction that is comfortable. The mind controls everything. So what I realized was that when I was growing up and I was 300 pounds and I got all bad and I got all insecure, I realized that my mind kept taking me in this direction. When things got uncomfortable for me, when I was facing my insecurities, I was facing my fears, my mind said, oh no, we got the tactical advantage. We just get you, separate you from this feeling. This feeling of your life is all about feelings. We want the happy feeling. We don't want that feeling of this sucks. Why am I here? And you don't have any, so you can't answer those questions. So you I started realizing that if in that moment you can answer those the questions and you are now in charge of your brain versus your brain ruling you, that's where all that stuff comes from. So, so, so the 40% rule is all of that. Get the 40%, your brain says, we're done. Let's roll, man. This is going to get painful. This is uncomfortable. So you sit down. Everybody's different. That's how the book kind of talks about it. Like, how much you think about 
you know, five steps to this and, and four steps to this. It's, it's not more than that. That's all bullshit. It's, it's a practice that you have to, it's a habit. So if you know that at 40%, I'm, you know, I'm feeling pain. At 40%, I'm feeling pain. That's where the 40% rule kicks in. Now it starts, okay, I'm, I'm feeling pain. My mind's saying all this shit to me. It's saying, get out of here, run, flee. The fight or flight kicks in. Okay, we're down, we're not good enough. It starts telling you all these things, you start to believe it. Because the mind controls all. This is the time where you have to get in control back of your mind. It's okay, let me see if I can go 45%. And once you start giving yourself more and more hope and start realizing, okay, the mind starts to be, okay, what, what are you doing? We're supposed to be going right and you're going left. You start then controlling your mind. Start finding more in, you know, in yourself. And then it goes from 40% to a lot further than that. That's the start of it. Get to, get to the spot where your mind is saying stop. Wherever that is, you gotta get there first. And then that's when it starts to work. You gotta control yourself in once and for all right here. Work. A lot. Based on what your mouth is saying. You want to be a millionaire? You need to become a workaholic. Right? You want to have good work-life balance and great family and be on the softball team and raise your kids and make a hundred thousand? That's an amazing, let me just say it real quick, that's a ridiculous life. Making a hundred thousand, that's a ridiculous life. You might 47,000 and see your kids and do your thing and be happy, that's great, right? But don't talk shit. Talk your reality. Talk your truth. Create a framework that you can follow. Because the only people listening to your excuses or your bullshit are your loser and friends. What is in us, we have no idea until we start trying hard. And I mean really trying hard when you're obsessed with, hey, this is my new norm. My new norm is that, wow, this isn't always fun. It's not always meant to be fun. And that's when you know you're trying hard. People want to know how to stop the laziness. They want to know how to stop the procrastination. You want to improve? You want to get better? You want to get on a workout program or a clean diet? You want to start a business? You want to write a book or make a movie or build a house or a computer or put together some mobile application? Where do you start? You start right here. And when do you start? You start right now. Sometimes your life will be in a slump, just like sports. Some of the best shooters can't hit baskets different times in games. They get in a slump. Do they sit on the sideline and say, you know, I just didn't hit a basket today? No, they continue to execute. I suggest to you that if you are facing a challenge, don't stop. Stay busy. Work your plan. Continue to do those things that you know that work for you after you have evaluated yourself in the situation. Continue to move, stay busy, stay busy, stay busy. Do not take the easy way out. Do not give up based on instinct. If you are forced to stand down, to retreat, so that you can rebuild and reattack, so be it. But make that decision based on logic not on the instinct of surrender and defeat. Get up, go, fight on. Every leader I have ever known had a dream, had a vision. In fact, I would say to you, if you're not seeing what could be and what you would like to have, I would say you probably are not a leader. But what I've discovered about dreams is this. Dreams are free, but the journey isn't. And so leaders go beyond just having a dream. They go beyond having a wish list, sitting around a table and kind of hoping something might come to pass. They understand that if they have a dream, if they're a dreamer, they have to pursue that. They have to take the journey. The dream's free, the journey isn't.
And what leaders find is that when they go forth through that dream, they continually have to pay that price. They continually have to realize that they make down payments on the dream they have. But there's one thing else I would like to say. All leaders realize that whatever they pay, it's worth the price because dreams for them do come true. Newtonian world is all about the predictable. It's all about predicting the future. But the quantum model of reality is, is about causing an effect. The moment you start feeling abundant and worthy, you are generating wealth. The moment you're empowered and feel it, you're beginning to step towards your success. The moment you start feeling whole, your healing begins. And when you love yourself and you love all of life, you will create an equal. Now you're causing an effect. And I think that's the, the difference between living as a victim in your world saying, I am this way because of this person or that thing or this experience. They made me think and feel this way. When you switch that around, you become a creator of your world. And you start saying, my thinking and my feeling is changing an outcome in my life. No, that's a whole different thing. And you start believing more that we're creators of reality. How do we then go from that, like mechanistically, mm -hmm. to begin this visualization process of something that's empowering? <laughs> it's me in a different state. It's my future self. Is it meditation? Is sure. it, what does that look like? If you're not being defined, by a vision of the future, then you're left with the old memories of the past and you will be predictable in your life. And if you wake up in the morning and you're not being defined by a vision of the future, as you see the same people and you go to the same places and you do the exact same thing at the exact same time, it's no longer that your personality is creating your personal reality. Now your personal reality is affecting or creating your personality. Your environment is really controlling how you think and feel unconsciously. Because every person, every thing, every place, every experience has a neurological network in your brain. Every experience that you have with every person produces an emotion. So some people will use their boss to reaffirm their addiction to judgment. They'll use their enemy to reaffirm their addiction to hatred. They'll use their friends to reaffirm their addiction to suffering. So now they need the outer world to feel something. So to change them is to be greater than your environment to be greater than the conditions in your world. And the environment is that seductive. So then, why is meditation a tool? Well, let's sit down, let's close our eyes. Let's disconnect from your outer environment. So if you're seeing less things, there's less stimulation going to your brain. If you're playing soft music or you have earplugs in, less sensory information coming to your brain. So you're disconnecting from your environment. If you can sit your body down and tell it to stay like an animal, Stay right here. I'm gonna feed you when we're done. You can get up and check your emails, you can log your text, but right now, you're gonna sit down and obey me. So then, when you do that properly, and the, you're not eating anything, you're smelling anything, or tasting anything, you're not up experiencing and feeling anything, you have to agree with me that you're being defined by a thought, right? So when the body wants to go back to its emotional past, and you become aware that your attention is on that emotion, and where you place your attention is where you place your energy. You're siphoning your energy out of the present moment into the past. And you become aware of that. And you settle your body back down in the present moment. Because it's saying, well, it's 8 o'clock. You're not going to get upset because you're in traffic around this time. And here you are sitting and we're used to feeling angry and you're off schedule. Oh, it's 11 o'clock and you usually check your emails and judge everybody. Well, the body's looking for that, that predictable chemical state. Every time you become aware that you're doing that and your body is craving those emotions and you settle it back down into the present moment, you're telling the body it's no longer the mind, that you're the mind. And now your will is getting greater than the program. And if you keep doing this over and over again, over and over again, over and over again, just like training a stallion or a dog, it's just going to say, huh, I'm going to sit. And the moment that happens, and the body is no longer the mind. When it finally surrenders, there's a liberation of energy. We go from particle to wave, from matter to energy. And we free ourselves from the chains of those emotions that keep us in a, in a familiar past. And we've seen this thousands of times. In fact, we can actually predict it now on a great scale. I don't care how good you are, I don't care how talented you are, I don't care how much you work on yourself, there are some times when things aren't going to go right. 
They just are not going to go right. There are times when anything that can happen will happen. Murphy's Law will be knocking at your door. Why? I don't know why. That's called life. Greatness is not this uh, wonderful, esoteric, elusive, uh, godlike feature that only the special among us uh, will ever taste. You know, it's something that truly exists in all of us. It's very simple. This is what I believe, and I'm willing to die for it. Now you have to set the new standards. Now you have to set the new mark. And be greater than you was yesterday. Realize that you are walking above ground for a reason. 2019 may have had its ups and downs, but you did not stay down. You knew what you had to do to get up, so you got up. I know the outcome, I know the purpose, and I look for leverage. Leverage is different than delegation. What's the problem with delegation? Delegation is you have all the things to be done, so you give it to someone else, and you tell them things to be done, and they don't do it, you're pissed off. Leverage says, I can be the biggest boulder in the world with a little bit of effort, and I got something I can do it with, and I'm still part of it. So leverage is, if I'm going to leverage something here with Tom, I'm going to make sure Tom understands the work. The outcome, I want to make sure Tom understands the, the purpose, the why, and the action. But I might say to Tom, if you get this done, without this action, or better action, go for it, baby. And I want to talk to you on this date, we got a promise, and we're going to check in before it's me. So there's no surprises. If you have a problem, Tom, come back to me, because we're partners on this. That I call leverage. And you know what I do when I have no time? There is time. I just got to leverage it. I'm saying, say, I'm going to leverage it too. You know, Shane over here, right? I got all the stuff he wants to do and can't leverage it. But Shane's answer was, hire somebody that he thinks about what it's going to take. And he wants $125,000. Can't do that now. He's getting caught up in one way to get the outcome. Leverage. He goes to his listing house. What if I got somebody to do 20% of this stuff? I, got, I could spend 20 grand to get that much freedom. I could pay for it times 10. And if I'm really productive, my productivity should enhance the world not only my clients and customers, but it should provide jobs for other people. And if there's anything you hate to do, it's because you're either ineffective at it or you don't think it's very important, but it is urgent. So you're going to hire somebody for those things. And ideally, somebody who loves that job. You'll never let it go when your time is eaten up for activities that aren't that important. Activity without high levels of purpose is the drain of your fortune. Do it now. If you can't get it all now, you're part of it now. Leverage is power. Leverage is ultimate power.